Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm very pleased to join with Martin Eriksson, who is a Swede who actually lives and resides in Malta, or should I say on Malta. Uh, Martin is uh, one of the people organizing an upcoming conference on the island of Malta called Corax, uh, which is going to feature none other than the great Hans Hermann Hoppe. So Martin, welcome and, and talk a little bit about this upcoming conference, which is, ladies and gentlemen, July 28th through 30th. Uh, I, I will also be speaking, but uh, but more importantly, as I mentioned, Hans Hoppe will be speaking. So, what's what's the uh, what are the origins of the conference, and why are you holding it? Yeah, so the the conference is the second annual Corax conference, and Corax is a libertarian media network which originated in Sweden under a different brand name. It's called Bubla in Sweden. It's a fairly large and successful libertarian project in Sweden, and Corax is the kind of embryonic. English language version that we do for an international audience. So the conference is uh, in part a way for our uh, our current readers, listeners, uh, followers to get together and meet each other in person. Uh, but it's also uh, hopefully a way to get some more attention internationally as we're now trying to uh, to build out uh, the the things we're doing in Sweden to, to try to make versions of them for a global audience. Well, in the U.S. Uh, we, we have a lot of European friends. There's a lot of Mises institutes in, in various countries in Europe. Uh, our perception, which may be correct or incorrect, our perception of European libertarianism, which is a broad phrase, uh, is, is that it's more classical liberal, a little less radical, a little less anarcho-capitalist, a little less Bitcoin-centric, and it's, and it's uh, uh, not as uh, hoppy and Rothbardian, more Hayekian. Would you say this is true, and is this something you're sort of fighting? Yes, I, I would say that it certainly has been true. I mean, from, from the 80s, uh, we had in Sweden, for example, uh, a somewhat strong libertarian movement, but it was uh, very much a kind of a, a left-wing libertarian style, ne neoliberal, as we would say. Uh, so that has been true traditionally, but I think it's uh, it's about to change. It has been changing for the last 10 years or so. Uh, the liberty movement is growing rapidly in Sweden as well as many other European countries. And uh, the, the growth we see is not in the kind of uh, traditional libertarian networks or, or, or oriented around the neoliberal think tanks and so on. It's uh, uh, much more of an uh, independent networks and organizations. And in... Uh, I think that the main event that kind of got it started, reignited the libertarian movement was uh, Ron Paul and his uh, uh, candidacy for presidency in 2008 and 2012. So now when we meet new people, we find new new libertarians. Uh, usually they don't come from the traditional political organizations. They haven't been in touch with the think tanks and so on. Uh, they, they read about Ron Paul online and got inspired. And then they went to Mises.org and read up and then maybe several years later, they found out that, oh, there's actually libertarians in, in even in Sweden. And then they got in touch with us. So I think the, the growth we see now is uh, is uh, almost exclusively in these uh, these more radical uh, uh, circles. And for example, in Sweden, we have a, a very active and uh, quite excellent local chapter of the Mises Institute, for example. Uh, they've been an inspiration for me and many others. But we also have a, a, a huge anarcho-capitalist community, mostly based on Facebook and Facebook uh, discussion groups. And they have over 2,000 members in an, an anarcho-capitalist group in Sweden. So, so on a per capita basis, that's, uh, that's uh, two Swedes out of every 10,000 uh, are, are members in this anarcho-capitalist group. And that's, that's quite amazing. And now we have our project uh, growing very rapidly and, and has become the largest project. And we are certainly uh, a very radical, uh, anarchist-oriented, um, and also have a, a kind of conservative approach rather than a, a progressive attitude towards cultural issues. Well, you know, Martin, this is really fascinating to me because in, in the United States, as we saw with Ron Paul, 320 million people, it's very hard at the national level to have success. We don't have a parliamentary system. We have these two major parties that have locked down these primaries. And so even with all the momentum and excitement for Ron, um, there were certain primaries where he got a, a very low percentage, you know, even of Republican voters. So in a country like Sweden, where you have, I, I don't know what, Sweden, eight or 10 million people, perhaps, yeah. do, you, do you feel like you have 
uh, you know, more, more ability to operate politically because, you know, 100,000 libertarians in Sweden means more than 100,000 libertarians in the U.S. Yes, I think that's true. I think that's true in part. And <clears throat> there's there's drawbacks and benefits uh, of operating in, in Sweden. Uh, I think uh, today Sweden is mostly known as this kind of ultra progressive left wing paradise uh, kind of place. But that's that's not actually the. Yeah, I heard I heard somebody I heard somebody say Sweden is the tumbler of countries. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 actually a good description, I guess. So, but but, but, yeah. but this is not actually the the history of Sweden. Uh, Sweden right. became left wing quite recently, and before that, the tradition was quite different. So I think there is a kind of a Swedish or Scandinavian Nordic mentality, which actually has this kind of uh, rugged individualism, and we try to kind of. Uh, reconnect to the the older traditions, the older values and mentalities, and uh, we're having a lot of success uh, doing that. So I think that's uh, uh, and, and and certainly as you say, uh, a smaller group can get uh, more things done. I think in a, a small language area. I also think in Sweden there's there's a huge vacuum. I mean, in the U.S. there's plenty of libertarian podcasts, for example. Right. And now there's actually a good handful of them in Sweden as well, but there's more of a this kind of uh, uh, vacuum uh, f for us to fill. So there's uh, le less competition in some sense, you might say. So obviously we are close friends with Per Bieland, Bieland who is a, a Swede living here in the United States. He's a professor of entrepreneurship at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, what, what, who are some other Swedes? What are some other Swedish names we should know? A authors, libertarians, even politicians? Uh, well, <clears throat> I'm not sure who is, um, who is visible on the international stage. I mean, we, ha we have a lot of good people uh, doing stuff in Sweden. So in particular, I would say the people around the Mises Institute, people like uh, uh, Joachim Fagerström, Klaus Bandpintner, other people and they're doing an excellent podcast publishing a lot of good materials uh, otherwise I think the people who are doing really good work in Sweden they're not visible uh, on on the international stage so you wouldn't find any articles written by them in English uh, and so on and, and so Joachim I had the opportunity to meet at, at uh, uh, Hans Hoppe's uh, PFS property and Freedom Society summit in Bodrum Turkey a few years back uh, tell us about your relationship with Hoppe and how uh, he came to be the uh, headlining speaker at your upcoming conference. Yeah, sure. So, so I, when the the Mises Institute started in Sweden, I think this was 2011. They had the first Swedish uh, Freedom Fest, uh, their conference. Uh, that, that was quite new. Their approach uh, and their style was quite new on the libertarian scene because they had this kind of uh, conservative approach. They were talking about about Hoppe, of course. Uh, but it was uh, much more of a, a paleo libertarian uh, kind of kind of style, and and previously everything had been very very much kind of a, a neoliberal, a progressive, culturally left wing type of libertarianism, and I was uh, much more into the kind of a paleo uh, type of ideology, so I was quite excited. Went to the first conference and went to uh, several of the uh, the other conferences. And I think this uh, this kind of initiated a, a change where the, the the conservative part of the movement grew and the the, the other part sort of withered away. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think about it as a conflict. We tried to be a big tent. We tried to be friendly with with everyone. Uh, but the fact is that uh, when we focus on a kind of more uh, pure right wing perspective and conservative values. Uh, we're obviously growing a lot faster than the other ones are doing. And uh, regarding Hoppe, I simply think he's the, the finest libertarian thinker uh, who, who is living currently. I'm, I'm immensely impressed uh, by his work on, on several levels. And so, so I personally and many others try to uh, spread the word, get people to read him, refer to him as, as a sort of uh, theoretical uh, authority. And uh, when we were putting together this conference, the conference uh, last year was kind of uh, uh, low, low budget, uh, hastily put together just a few weeks before, before it, uh, it uh, occurred. Uh, but this time we had more time to plan. So we made a list of, of uh, uh, speakers, potential speakers. So who would we 
uh, really want to have. If we could just make a wish and have a- anything we wanted, who would be the, the absolute top speaker we could imagine? And and that was a really easy question. That was obviously Hoppe for us. So so um, uh, Sophia uh, sent him an email, and um, a- after a bit, he suggests, and that was that was super exciting. We we actually caught some flack uh, among Swedish libertarians for inviting him and and, and promoting the conference uh, with his name and so on. Uh, but that's that that was that was mostly fun. Well. I think Hoppe's controversial opinions, to the extent anyone thinks they're controversial, I think are are wildly overblown. And I think a lot of Hoppe's biggest critics are those who are least familiar with his work. I mean, what we're really talking about here is a a private society of one's own making. And that could be culturally as left, right, or otherwise uh, as as the uh, the in-group cared to make it. So I I think a a lot of this is overblown. And I think a lot of Hoppe's work on uh, property rights and ethics uh, is, are absolute must-reads for anyone who calls themselves a libertarian. So uh, tell us a little bit about Malta itself. What, what, are, what are the appeals? Is, is, does, does, Malta have, um, uh, does, does Malta hold out opportunities for libertarians? Why have you come to, uh, to, to live there and, and hold your conference there? Yeah, so to begin with, we wanted to get out of Sweden since the situation in Sweden is deteriorating rather rapidly and uh, we wanted to be in a, in a safer country, uh, have some, some calm and safety, be surrounded by people with uh, traditional values. And Malta is a, is a very good choice for many people in Europe since it's part of the EU, so it's very easy to travel here and get residency uh, and so on. It's uh, uh, They have a lot of uh, kind of market liberal uh, approaches uh, to government. They're very welcoming to uh, to the people and companies. The taxes are low. Regulations are generally uh, quite tolerable. Uh, the climate is is uh, very very good. It's quite excellent, especially if you come from from Sweden. So I think Malta has a really good mix, and there's a, a, a large expat community here generally, uh, partly due to the regulations of uh, online gambling and finance few other industries, which makes pe- uh, companies move here and people come here to work. Uh, but there's also a growing libertarian uh, a group here who are mostly just wanting to live live more freely under a freer jurisdiction, pay a, a little bit less taxes and so on. So so we have regular meetups with just just the, the Swedish libertarian expats on Malta and have, have big meetups uh, a couple of times uh, per month. So I think it's, uh, it's a good kind of... Um, uh, it's a good um, escape hatch if you're in Europe, uh, because it's a lot better here than in most other places. I mean, a lot of the, the problems going on in in the northern Europe with the, the huge welfare states, the ever increasing taxes, uh, uh, mass immigration uh, subsidized by the government, and so on. Uh, none of that stuff is really happening on Malta. It's it's a very kind of uh, a traditional, slow kind of Mediterranean society with uh, basically no crazy stuff going on. Well, it sounds like an absolutely fascinating place, and I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to, to seeing Malta. Uh, give us your website and tell, tell us how people can find out if they, if they care to attend this conference or at least find out more about Corax generally. Yeah, so let me mention first that uh, uh, the Corax website is cor.ax. And the, the conference website is uh, conf.ax. Corax.news. That's so. That's at c o r a x dot news. Uh, so so uh, you also find a link to the conference from the main main Corax site. So that's that's a good place uh, to start. And are there presumably uh, pretty easy direct flights from places like Rome, Frankfurt, Paris, London into Malta? Yes, Malta is something of a travel hub, so it's very easy to get here. Uh, there are uh, cheap flights. Uh, different depending on where you come from, obviously, but uh, basically anywhere you come from is easy to get here. And it's a, it's a rather inexpensive place. That's one of the reasons uh, uh, we like to live here and, and people come here. Well, Martin Erickson, thanks a million for your time uh, and for putting together this conference and especially for hosting Hans Hermann Hoppe and, and promoting these these ideas. They're so important and for uh, for having the courage 
uh, and the vision to, uh, to, to leave Sweden, if that's what's best for you and your, uh, and, and your life. So uh, we look forward to meeting you in person uh, someday soon. And, and Take care. Thanks for having me.